this is kind of cool. We're starting and there's like a whole bunch of people here. It's, I guess that's something nice that'll come out of having Sunday school first. There's a lot of people who are already here. They're in the building and they're ready to worship. So let's go ahead and start this morning. We're going to start with, hello, my name is. love this for so many months it was kind of like recording and worshiping but worshiping with everybody here is just amazing I love it so let's all just sing our hearts out to our father who loves us so much more than we can imagine Worthy 
we're going to continue our worship, worshiping our God, who is our healer.
funny how meaningful so many of these songs are. I mean, some of them we've been doing for a while. Some of them are a little bit newer, like like the first one that we did, um, Hello, My Name Is. I will never, ever lose that feeling of being in the back row, going through some really horrible times and just Ruthie singing with me and snuggling me and just reminding me that I am a child of God and God loves me and God just sees me with love. And anything you might think about yourself, not true. All those negative things that we hear coming through our mind, God tells us the truth, so I love being able to sing truths about how, how God sees us and how much God loves us, and I love being able to love God back like that. Um, the last song that we did, Healer, has just become even obviously more meaningful this year, just with everything going on. I mean, it seems like in the ambulance, we're bringing in COVID patients like every two seconds, every two seconds, every two seconds. And it was like just that protection to be able to be out in the community where God led me to be. I mean, I took the EMT class before new COVID was going to be a thing. And I'm very thankful because I was able to go and help when it was needed. But just knowing that I have God's protection, I have God's love. Amen. And it's kind of cool when, I don't know, I've, I've done plenty of not listening to God in the past. And when you're listening to God, it's like, it's just comforting, it's soothing, it just gives you a little more confidence and protection. So I love the times on Sunday morning when it's not just me singing, it's me and my brothers and si sisters all singing and praising our God and just how awesome and wonderful he is. So I thank you all for just being here with us. And I just, let's just pray for a minute. Dear Father God, I say this pretty much every week, but thank you for loving us, God. Thank you for being our loving Father, God. Thank you for just all the protection that you give us, God. Thank you that you will walk with us through the fires and you'll calm our raging seas. I mean, I'm sure pretty much everybody in here has had some raging seas in this last year. God, I just thank you that you are our comfort, God. I just imagine a picture from the psalm of just being under your wings and you just protecting us as all the flaming arrows are flying by and all the pestilence is outside, God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your protection, God, and thank you for the greatest gift, God, your son, with whom, without whom we would be, I, I'm like, how do I put it lightly? We'd be damned, God. None of us are perfect. So thank you, God, that you gave your only son because you love us that much, God. I just pray that we can continue to love you and to sing praises to you. And thank you for being here with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to continue with Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. <laughs> Grace, my 
Well, good morning. It is a joy to begin experiencing the original normal. And uh, we'll continue that on, but just to be able to have a Sunday morning, similar to the way we've experienced it uh, so very, very often before this last year, we're glad to be able to be together. Let me start with a few announcements. The first is that next Sunday after church is the Memorial Day picnic. Uh, and uh, you can sign up for that. There's some information on that uh, uh, on the back table and make sure that, that you do that and then stay around after the service for the picnic. And then uh, in June, on Sunday, June the 6th at 7 o'clock at night, we're having a concert, and that's the uh, Ben Lane concert. So keep that in mind and make sure you come. Uh, we've heard him before, uh, and it'll be a really good time and invite people to come with you and enjoy the music and the message that he has. And then in the coming weeks, uh, there's going to be started again a grief share, uh, small group, uh, and uh, that is called A Journey from Mourning, M-O-U-R-N, uh, to Joy. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, get in touch with Brian, and sometime you'll be hearing more about that. So keep that in mind. Okay? Today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, and uh, so as I go into prayer, we're going to focus in on that great gift of the Holy Spirit there at that first Pentecost, and he continues to be here with us and was poured out upon God's people. So let's join together in prayer. Lord, today we celebrate Pentecost. We thank you, that Lord Jesus, that after your death and resurrection and you were exalted on high, you poured out the great gift of the Holy Spirit upon your people. And he came to give us life, came to unite us to Christ, and came to enable the Father and the Son to live within us, came to transform our hearts. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the spirit of truth. Uh, and that as we look at the scriptures now and any time during the course of the week, that you are the one who has inspired that word and that you make the word of God come real to us. We thank you that you are the spirit of wisdom. And we face different situations that we don't always know what to do, but we can go and experience your leading and guiding, and many times you'll bring scripture passages to mind, but in any case, there's nothing that we will face, no difficulty that we face, but you have the wisdom for that. We thank you that you're the spirit of power, uh, and we face things that, that drain us, that weaken us, uh, that cause us to know how we're going to continue on in the future. Uh, and we thank you that your power is able to be with us uh, on an ongoing basis. We thank you that you are also the spirit of hope. And whether it's thinking about later that day, that week, that month, the next year, or anything else like that, we thank you that you are present with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And so everything that we need uh, is provided for us in your presence and your activity, and we are so grateful for that. 
And we pray that you will continue to work in our lives. You tell us you want us to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, to constantly yield our lives to you over and over again. And the more we are yielded, the more you are able to work in us and through us those things that are pleasing to God and life-giving to us and other people as well. And we do know, Holy Spirit, that you were given to be the ultimate witness to Jesus. And so we pray as we interact with people, you know, in, in family and friends and neighborhood and work associations and all the rest, that you want those people to hear and learn about the Lord Jesus. And so may we constantly depend upon you to be able to give a word in season and to point people toward the Lord Jesus. Father, as a church, it's, it's good for us to have the things getting back to uh, the normal that we're used to. And we pray not only for the uh, Sunday services, but we pray for the different ministries that we've had. Some have been able to continue on. Some we are starting up again. But anything that will be used of you to restore us as people and give us strength and deepen our discipleship and our walk with you, we pray that we will see more and more of your work uh, in those ways. And we ask, Father, that uh, you will be with us as we think about the, the people that, uh, that have gone through this really tough year with us. Uh, and as we listen to folks and, and uh, seek to support them as they talk about any hardship or challenge that they faced and, and empathize with them and then can speak about how you have been with us uh, during that time and how you will constantly be with us and help us to be able to share the Lord Jesus with others and that they can see a difference that you brought in our lives. And that will be used by you to help them to encourage to seek the Lord Jesus as well. Father, we want to pray for uh, Ruthie Richardson today. Uh, she has come back from Pennsylvania to Connecticut. And she's here in the hospital at this time and with both heart and lung uh, condition. Uh, and uh, I haven't heard in the last day, but when I talked with her family members uh, two days ago, uh, they said she's still in, in good spirits, and we pray that you will work through that uh, and bring the level of healing that she wants and she needs, and we're glad that we'll be able to be in touch with her on a more regular basis uh, as she's back here at this particular time uh, in Connecticut. And Father, for anyone uh, who is still dealing with the effects of COVID or any other kind of illness or, or for accidents or anything else, uh, you care for us as, as people, for everything that is important to us is important to you. Uh, we thank you that uh, whenever we know of someone who's going through a hard time, that you enable us to give a call or a word of encouragement or send a card or other things like that. May any way in which we can encourage and support people who are going through hardship, may that be increasingly true uh, in each of our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that you have said, uh, Jesus, you said, I am the true vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So I pray for all of us that we will continue to yield ourselves, walk with you, abide in you. Your words will abide in us. And therefore, as we pray and obey, you say you will bring about many good results. And the Father is glorified as we bear fruit in our lives not just as individuals or just as families, but as a church family, as a body of believers. And we pray your blessing not only in our church. I pray for all the churches, not only in our state and our area, but across the country. Uh, the churches have been impacted by this past year. We've been weakened in different ways this past year. Uh, and we pray that you will restore us and help us to gain a spiritual life and momentum and a deepness uh, uh, in our own walk with you and an ongoing desire to make sure that we talk with people about the Lord Jesus, who is the most important person we can ever talk about. So we pray that you'll be with us this day. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All of us have had the satisfaction of reading a book to the end. But some books add something else called an epilogue, which is additional material that sort of rounds out the story. Well, 
For us, we have been spending a lot of time going through the book of Acts. And today, we're going to be looking at the last chapter in the book of Acts. But when we get to the end of the last chapter, we're not at the end of the story. Because I'm going to have us think about some things that we learned from the end of Paul's different letters. Oftentimes, we get to the end of Paul's letters, and it's like, okay, I've got the basic content and, and truth and some practical advice, and now I just see some names of different people. I think I'll skip over that. Uh, and I would like to spend a little bit of time saying, that's some really valuable information for us. And the overall theme that I want to emphasize today is that ministry continues on. And we're going to see a case study of that in Paul, not only when he's in Rome, but how his ministry continues on, quote, after we're finished with the last chapter of the book of Acts. So uh, let's take a minute now and just sort of give an overview, the big picture of the book of Acts. After his uh, death and resurrection and before he ascended to heaven, Jesus once again gave his disciples the Great Commission. And it's expressed this way in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then you look at this large book, 28 chapters, and it's broken into two broad categories. And the first half is the progress of the gospel among the Jews. And the primary person for that is the Apostle Peter. And so it begins with the progress of the gospel in Jerusalem. That's chapters 2 through 7. And then it's the progress of the gospel in Palestine generally. That's chapters 8 through 12. That's the first half, the gospel to the Jews. The second half is the progress of the gospel among the Gentiles. And the primary person for that is the Apostle Paul. And uh, in the middle of the book, it begins with the progress of the gospel through Paul when he is at liberty, starting in chapter 13 and going through the middle of chapter 21. And then from the middle of 21 to the end of chapter 28 is the progress of the gospel when Paul is in captivity. And so that's the big picture of where we've been and how we're going to try to close things off today. And so we're going to start by thinking about being with Paul as he's there in Rome and presenting the gospel at Rome. Now, a few years before he gets to the place of going to Rome, he's writing a book to the Romans, a letter to the Romans. And in that, he says this. I hope somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So he wants to come. I don't think he was expecting he would get there uh, as, as a captive, but, but he was saying, this is what I want to be able to do. And in that first chapter, he gives one of his basic convictions. It's chapter 1, verse 18. I know you've heard this verse before. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And so, since he's a person who's now in Rome, who does he always start with wherever he goes into a new city? He always starts with the Jews. So... Uh, as it turns out, he's there in Rome, and they have been, they've been, they're treating him very, very well. He's not in a prison at this point. Uh, he is sort of under house arrest. So he has a, a soldier there with him, and he's chained to the soldier. But basically, he has this house, and he has all, all kinds of people can come and visit with him. And so the first thing he does is he reaches out to try to get in touch with the Jewish leaders of the local synagogue. And they come in, and he sort of gives them the background. Let me tell you about why I'm here, you know, in case you hear anything from Jerusalem about me. And they said, no, no one has, has said anything about you. In fact, we're interested in learning more about you. But then they go on and say, we desire to hear what your views are, for with regard to this sect, that's the way they refer to the Christians, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So Paul thinks, okay, these are the local local rabbis, I want to set up a time where I can get the leaders of all the synagogues <clears throat> in Rome to have them all come for a day because I want to speak to them. And so that's what they did. They set that up. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him in his lodging in greater numbers. So now you have basically the Jewish leadership in the Roman area are now there with him. From morning until evening, he expounded to them 
testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Now, as we think about his teaching elsewhere and this whole idea of the law and the prophets and he's going to share things with them, basically what he's going to do, though we don't have this spelled out in detail in chapter 28, is that he is going to speak to these Jewish leaders about what we call the Old Testament. To them, it's the law and the prophets, okay? He's going to go over promise after promise after promise God makes about someone that he is going to bring into the world who will be the most important person that has ever come into the world. So promise after promise after promise. And then he's going to move to the gospel. The gospel is good news. These are the facts. This is what God promises. And here is what actually happened through Jesus. And he begins to put those together. And as a result, he is making an appeal to all those Jewish leaders to embrace what the Old Testament promises and to trust in Jesus who actually fulfills those promises. So what are some of the things that he might have covered? Well, just think about this. He could have easily started off with a promise that God made to Abraham in chapter 12. That one of your descendants is so special that through him all the families of the earth will be blessed. He might have turned them to Deuteronomy 18. Talk about Moses. Where Moses promises that I will, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. It is to him you shall listen. And they were very much aware. There is the prophet who's going to be coming. We know that promise that God has made about the prophet who's coming. But there's another promise about someone who's going to come as a priest. Not a descendant of Aaron or Levi, but a special priest. God makes a, an oath. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This unusual priest is going to make an offering and sacrifice for sin that is greater than any other sacrifice. So there is the promise of a prophet. There's a promise of a priest. There's a promise of a king. Because from the line of David, he promises one of your descendants is going to sit on your throne and he's going to be a king. So there's a prophet and a priest and a king that he talks about. And then he might well have turned to the book of Micah and said, this is what we know. This special person is going to be born in a small town of Bethlehem, a ruler whose origins are from the distant past. Now, it's interesting. He's going to be born, but the person who's going to be born at Bethlehem has lived for many, many, many years, go into the distant past. And you might say, well, well how could someone who's already been alive into the distant past still be born? And then he might have turned to Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Oh, so he's a child, but he's also Mighty God. And they're starting to get the picture of this person that is being promised to them. And not only that, but God promises that he's going to pour out his spirit upon one person in a special way, the, the Anointed One or the Messiah, he promises in Isaiah 42, I have put my spirit upon him. And then he would have moved to the book of Isaiah, the great servant of the Lord, four passages, the servant songs. And the fourth one is the passage on the suffering servant who is coming. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. And so there is the great servant who is going to suffer, not for his own wrongs, but suffer for the sins of other people. And he's going to die. But that's not the end of the suffering servant. Because we find in the Psalms, you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life. This one who's going to die for the sake of others is going to be raised to life. And so with promise after promise after promise, and these are... These are Jewish scholars. They, they know the scriptures. They could relate. They might have never put them all together, thinking that they're all talking about one person, but now they're hearing this. And as he goes through this, he then moves into the gospel, the good news, and he tells them the facts. This Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This Jesus had the anointing of the Holy Spirit that came on him as a dove at his own baptism. This Jesus came as the savior of the world, of both Jews and Gentiles. 
This Jesus died on the cross, though he himself was righteous and perfect, but he did it as a sacrifice of himself to bring salvation to people. And on the third day, God raised this Jesus from the dead, and he is alive today. And then he would go into his own testimony. Let me tell you, I was one who originally tried to crush this belief in Jesus of Nazareth as though he were really God's Messiah. I, I gathered up everybody that I could in Jerusalem, and I wanted to gather even more, and so I got letters from the, the high priest in Jerusalem to go to Damascus. And on my way to Damascus, this Jesus appeared to me, blinding light. I saw him. And I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And he gave me a call to go and to tell everybody about him. He is alive. I testify to that. I've experienced that. And I want you to know that all of these promises have been fulfilled in Jesus. And I encourage you to open up your life and to trust in him as I have because he has become my savior and my Lord and I appeal to you to do the same thing. And so he makes this case before them. It's what we call the gospel. In summary, what is the gospel? It's all about Jesus. It's all about who he is and what he has done. Who is he? He is God-man. The only one who can bring God and man together. What has he done? He's lived a perfect life. He's died for the sins of sinners, as we all are. And he's been raised from the dead to give eternal life to all who trust in him. And he makes the appeal. And everywhere that Paul goes, and we've seen this throughout the book of Acts, he makes Jesus the central issue. And wherever Jesus has made the central issue, people always divide. Because some people, upon hearing about Jesus, respond to him, even as we're told there in Acts 28. Some were convinced of what he said. And when they trusted in him, as Paul himself did, just like Paul and just like all the rest of us, they experienced forgiveness of sins, they experienced eternal life, and they began to experience it right at the moment they trusted in him. But as we see in other times, some disbelieved. And whether that was their final response or whether they disbelieved at that moment and they would come back later and think about it later, which, well, might have happened. Everything is centered around Jesus. And so, uh, not surprising, when we think about Paul, he's there in Rome, what does he do? Get all the Jewish leaders around. He spends a whole morning, afternoon, and into the evening in great detail, explaining about Jesus, passionately explaining about Jesus and the importance of calling people to trust in him. And for those of us who have heard that message before, whether a year ago or 30 years ago or whatever, and have made that commitment to him, we know what it is like to experience him. He is a living savior. He has come to live within us and transform us. And the message that we have, the most important thing we can say to anybody is to do what Paul did, and that is to talk about Jesus at the appropriate time and appropriate way to whoever, whatever that person is, and maybe once and maybe 10 times over a five-year period to continue to talk about Jesus. But that's what happens when he goes to Rome. And his ministry, immediately he launches into talking about Jesus. But as we get to the very end of Acts chapter 8, we're sort of given a door into something else that goes beyond that, and that he is going to be there for a couple years, uh, and he has people coming to visit him all the time. And Paul's ministry does not stop because he's, quote, stuck in one place. What we'll see in connection with the different friends who come and spend time with him, he is going to continue his ministry on in a variety of different ways. And we are beneficiaries of the ongoing ministry that he did as people were coming to talk with him. So, this is what we read at the end of Acts 28. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And so now we see Paul, he's talked to the Jewish leaders, and the question is, well, I guess... You know, he's there, he's chained to a soldier. That's probably the end of his ministry. Not even close. 
He has these people coming. And we're going to look for a moment at some of the different people that are coming to visit him. And one of those is a man named Epaphras. He came from the province of Asia. We today would call that uh, Western Turkey, okay? He had probably met Paul when Paul spent three years there in Ephesus. And Epaphras went back and began to preach Christ in his own town, which was Colossae. And he planted a church there in the town of Colossae. But he hears about Paul and he ends up going to Rome to spend some time with Paul. Paul even refers to him as a fellow prisoner. So he must have spent some time there in this house arrest situation that Paul was at. And Paul, see, this is a wonderful, godly man. He refers to him as a beloved fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ, someone who's always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And as Epaphras spends time with them, he says, Paul, I'm really concerned. You know, God has blessed us. We have a church. But there's some false teaching that's coming in that's a combination of some Jewish thought and some pagan folk religion. And I'm trying to protect our people from this because this false religion is undermining the supremacy of Christ. And so what does Paul do? He continues his ministry by writing a letter. Timothy is there with him. Paul's chained, okay, but Timothy is there, and so it's probably Timothy. Paul says, I want you to, uh, to write down these things. So he begins to give Timothy the words, and Timothy writes out, and we now have a letter to the Colossians. It's Paul's ongoing ministry as his way of ministering to his friend Epaphras. Then there's another person. You know, he welcomes all these people, okay, so there's another man who comes in. His name is Onesimus. This man had been a slave. He had stolen money from his uh, master, and he had run away. How do you get? How do you hide yourself? Go to the biggest city in the empire. But while he's there, somehow he hears about Paul, and he ends up visiting Paul. So what does Paul do? Shares Christ with him, and he leads Onesimus to Christ. He refers to him as, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And so this man who had been a slave before he came to know Christ is, has this mentality, oh, God has saved me. I am here to serve. And so he pours himself into helping Paul in any way that he possibly can. Uh, Paul talks about the fact that uh, he, he served my imprisonment for the gospel. And in the conversations with this man, he says, well, you know, you were a slave. You know, uh, who was your master? They say, oh, it was a man named Philemon. Philemon, I knew him years ago when I was in Ephesus. He came and I led Philemon to Christ. He lives in the town of Colossae. Oh, yeah, he, he goes to a church there that Epaphras has been pastoring. <laughs> so what does Paul do? He wants to continue ministry. So he says, Timothy, come on over here. Take this down. And he ends up writing a personal letter to Philemon. So that's the way he continues ministry for the benefit of Onesimus. And then there's another man who's there with Paul. And he's been around this man before. His name is Tychicus. Uh, and he was a very trustworthy man. He was also from western part of Turkey. And he was one of the small number of people who were entrusted with a very large gift of money that Gentile Christians took, gathered together to have it taken to Jerusalem to help the poor Christians who were there. Very trustworthy man. Very godly man. Again, he describes him as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant of the Lord. So as Paul's thinking about this, he's, he has the letter to Colossians, he has the letter to Philemon, and he thinks about the fact that, you know, I got to know those people through my ministry in Ephesus, and Tychicus was there. So he decides, okay, I'm going to continue and write a letter to the church at Ephesus. So there's Timothy you know, writing down what Paul wants him to say to the church at Ephesus. And it's interesting, if you've never done it before, sometime take part of a week or something and read the four chapters of Colossians and right after that read the sixth chapter to the Ephesians. Those books are written back to back and you'll see some real similarities between them. For example, in both cases, you'll see different pagan religions and, and demonic powers and principalities who are fighting against the church, and Jesus is supreme. And you'll see his complete supremacy over the false religions and the demonic powers that are impacting those two churches. 
from a practical standpoint, you'll see something in those two books you don't see anywhere else. Paul uses the picture of the change that happens when we trust in him. And it's like a change of garments. And so he says, what you need to do is you need to put off. Put off this old lifestyle, this way of thinking and acting and doing things that was characteristic of your life before Christ. And put on the new life of following Christ and righteousness and true holiness and the spirit of God is working in you. So put that off and put this on. You'll see that in both of those books. And so Paul has now continued his ministry by writing three letters. And he turns to Tychicus and said, uh, Brother, I appreciate you being with me here, but I have a job for you to do. I want you to take these three letters. And first of all, I want you to go to Ephesus and bring the letter to the Ephesians church. And then you go beyond there and you go to Colossae. That's 100 miles inland. Uh, and uh, you give this letter to Epaphras for the sake of his church, and you give this personal letter to Philemon because they're going to write to him about Onesimus. And I'm encouraging him how he is to respond as a master to this man who stole from him and ran away from him, and I want to show him how to respond as a believer. So he had these different individuals, and Paul continues his ministry through these people through writing. But there's other people who decide to visit Paul when he's in prison. And there's another man who's named Epaphroditus. Now, this was a man from Philippi in Macedonia. And the Macedonian church was the only church of all the churches that Paul planted, that was the only church that tried to financially support him. And they'd done it on a number of times. And when they learned that Paul was in prison, they turned to Epaphroditus and say, we want you to go to Rome. And there's two things we want you to do. First of all, we want to send Paul a gift. I mean, we've done it before, but it's really important that he knows our love for him in this way. Paul describes it as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So you go and you personally bring this gift to him for his financial needs. But in addition to that, Epaphroditus, you know, if it were possible, many of us would go uh, and, and serve Paul. But, you know, he's in Rome. That's hundreds of miles away. Okay. So I want you, we want you to go and you represent our church and you serve him representing the body of believers in the church of Philippi. And this man took that so seriously and just so poured himself into that, he ended up breaking down his own health. Uh, and uh, now Paul's dealing with somebody who's there to help him but has tried so hard that he's made himself sick. And Paul says this, he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And as, as Paul's talking about this, you know, you should imagine, yes, he's, he's chained to a Roman soldier, but this is part of the imperial guard, and of course they would change different soldiers from time to time. And I can just imagine these soldiers saying, I have been around a lot of prisoners. Nothing like this guy. I mean, you can't believe it. He has people coming to him all the time. And he's writing letters and he's encouraging and he's praying for people. Uh, and uh, that word goes throughout the entire imperial guard. This is what is said. It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. One, you know, hear about this prisoner. What, what crime did he do? He killed somebody? No, no, no. No crime at all. Really? Why is he there? Well, because he believes in Jesus and uh, they tried to shut him down, and so he ended up here. But what an amazing person. And so you end up with a number of the imperial guard coming to know Christ, as well as just being around Paul. But Paul wants to continue his ministry for the sake of Epaphroditus and the church that sent him. So he continues on by saying, Timothy, come here. <laughs> I'll tell you what to write. And he writes a letter to the Philippians. And when he's done with that letter, he, and, and Epaphroditus is well enough to be able to travel again, he sends that letter to the Philippians to that church by Epaphroditus. These are known as the prison letters, the prison epistles. So Paul, even though he's stuck in one place, he doesn't stop ministering. He's using these letters. But then we find out that, and we don't know the details why, he's, he's released from prison. So what does Paul do when he doesn't have to stay in one place. He's going to travel and he's going to do ministry. So he takes with him another one of his long-term friends who's there with him. His name is Titus. 
Now, Titus is something, someone that he had led to Christ, most likely when he was there in Ephesus. He refers to him as my true child in a common faith. He had spent a lot of time with Paul, especially when Paul was working with the church in Corinth, which was a cantankerous church. Uh, and so Titus was the one that did a lot of the work for helping Paul, working through the issues there uh, at uh, Corinth. So he's a well-known, very respected guy. And so Paul says, look, I don't have to stay in one place. Let's go somewhere and do ministry. Come on, Titus, we're going to go to Crete. So they go to the island of Crete, which is in the eastern Mediterranean. It's a, it's a long, narrow island. And they spend time on mission in Crete. But Paul doesn't want to stay in Crete too long because he wants to go to other places as well. So he says to Titus, okay, you stay here. Look, I'm going to write out for you some directions. You've never been a pastor of a church before, but we have seen groups of people in small house churches across Crete, and you're responsible for them. So I'm going to write out for you what you need to do in order to be able to minister to them. And he says, to put what remained in order and to appoint elders in every church. He says, Titus, look, don't think that you're going to be able to do this all by yourself. So he gives them the guidelines of the elders and said, find these kind of men in each of the house churches that you are at, that we've helped to establish. And these men will be able to help you continue on the ministry. But then he goes on and mentions um, different things about the importance of sound doctrine and godly living. And he has this really interesting passage in, in Titus chapter 2. He said, look, in terms of discipling the women, Yes, you, you preach the word, but here's the key. The older women are going to be the key to discipling the younger women. It's the older women who are going to talk about how to be married and how to raise children and live as a godly woman. So you make sure that you pour into the older women. They'll take care of the younger women. Uh, and so he gives different directions for that. So Paul leaves Titus there in Crete. But the way he continues his ministry for the island of Crete is he writes to Titus. Where's he going to head? Well, he's going to head back to the province of Asia. He's going to head back to western Turkey. So he goes to Colossae because he told Philemon in the letter that he sent, he said, I want you to prepare a guest room for me. So I'm sure that he goes into Colossae and spends some time there and sees things. And then he comes back to Ephesus, which is on the coast. And when he's there at Ephesus, he has Timothy with him. And Timothy was his true son in the faith. Uh, and uh, so they're, they're in, in Ephesus. He has spent three years in Ephesus. So basically at that point, Paul's just sort of getting the lay of the land. Okay, update me. What's been happening since I've been away? Okay. And once he has an idea what's happening, he says, Timothy, look, uh, I, need to, I need to move on from here. I'm going to go back to, to Macedonia but I am going to minister to you by writing out how you can be a pastor. We know this as 1 Timothy. So he writes, and he continues his ministry once again by writing. Uh, and uh, what he tells Timothy is, here's three major things that you need to be aware of to be this pastor of this church. First, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. They started to have people move away from the doctrines about Christ. And so he gives them directions on that. He gives them a lot of information about how do you develop the corporate life of this church. And in the third chapter, he gives him detailed instructions. These are the kind of people to look for as elders. These are the kind of people to look for for deacons. And you'll remember just even just a week ago when we had our membership meeting, what did we have down as the list? First Timothy chapter 3. These are the guidelines that God has given us. And every church for the last 2,000 years has gone back to those guidelines that he gave Timothy because he's trying to minister to Timothy. And then he has a lot in there about Christ-like living. He has things in there about the importance of, of caring for widows. Uh, and he says, look, I know you're a younger man. You're going to be younger than a lot of people you're ministering to. Don't let that bother you. You are to be an example, an example of faith and love uh, and, and following me. Uh, and I want you to look at your own life. Be careful for your life and be careful for what you teach because that will be important to the benefit of everybody in that church. And so he gives that letter. Actually, Titus and Timothy are both young pastors, and so those letters are called the pastoral epistles. So Paul continues to minister, and he does it through writing. So Paul's continuing to move around until something happens 
a few years later in 64 AD, when there was a fire that ends up burning half of the city of Rome. And many people felt, Emperor Nero is behind this, but how do you hold him responsible? Well, Emperor Nero decided he needed to get some sca scapegoats. So he focused in on the Christians. And now there is this really severe persecution, starts in Rome and spreads throughout the Roman Empire. Shortly after that persecution begins, Nero has the Apostle Peter executed. Sometime later than that, Paul is now in prison. Not in house arrest, he's now in a prison, a much more difficult place. And so what does Paul do? Now he's stuck in one place, he's stuck in a prison. What does he do? Ministry is going to continue on. And how did he do it? He writes a letter. He writes a second letter to Timothy. Uh, and in that second letter, he is trying to help Timothy with the situation that he is facing. Because now he said, in my first, first hearing on this, it didn't go well. Several people abandoned me and they accused me. And I don't know whether or not I'm going to come out of this or not. But he does say these things to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1, he says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Okay. That word to Timothy is not in good back then. Christians across the centuries have been benefited by that. And I think we need to be aware as our country is becoming increasingly aggressive in its secularism and increasingly rejecting and replacing biblical truth and biblical ethics, we can anticipate the pressure will come upon Christians to feel ashamed that we believe what we believe, to feel ashamed for standing for things that our culture is increasingly against. And of course, the power of shame is that we will silence ourselves. I don't want people to know about this because I'll have to end up paying a price. We have a cancel culture going on right now. And I think the word for us is, should we ever face that, we need to make sure we don't give in to shame. We believe in Christ, we believe in the gospel, and we will still talk about that and seek to live that out. And then in the second chapter, he gives uh, uh, an encouragement that is important, especially for some people in our church. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, some of us here have heard that verse many times in the last year or so because of the children's ministry during the week called Awana. A-W-A-N-A. -A -A. Right? Approved workmen are not ashamed. Uh, and uh, many women and men uh, work together uh, with Sandy Caldwell for this children's ministry of Awana, but that's the verse that they would always mention. But as Paul comes to the end of that letter, he says, looks to me that I only have a short time left. And he gives this word of challenge and word of encouragement. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That is a good verse, chapter 4, verse 7, for any one of us, whatever our age. We want to live in such a way that however long the Lord gives us to live, we want to be able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So even though he's once again stuck in a place, Paul's always thinking ministry. Ministry has to continue on. If he can do it in person, he does it in person. If he can do it by letter, he'll do it by letter. But that emphasis, ministry continues on, I think is important for us. So let me close by first of all speaking to those of us who have known Christ as our Savior uh, and are at a point right now where things are sort of coming back to normal. The impact of COVID on our church and on churches across the country is that it has limited and curtailed ministry in a variety of different ways. Not completely, but in significant ways. And we're starting to get back to normal. The Sunday morning is going back to normal. We have other ministries that we're continuing on and maybe other ministries that we want to do. But I would just say, we are so much like the Apostle Paul in this way. 
when Paul did ministry, he's such a larger-than-life figure. We sort of think of him as this individual doing all this stuff. Paul's always got himself surrounded by people. He's always working with people. He's always working through people. And so think about the ways in which your ministry is involved with other people. Maybe you're part of the worship team. Okay? Uh, maybe you're a person who's involved in a small group study or in a Sunday school class. Uh, maybe you're someone who's involved in other kinds of ministry uh, with, uh, with your friends. VBS is coming up last week in July, okay? That was mentioned uh, last week.